For centuries, the Central European lands belonging to the German people have remained a disunited and decentralized medley of free states, duchies, principalities, and kingdoms to name a few. And through it all, despite their similarities, the one thing holding these several states together has been the guidance of a strong and capable leader. Once upon a time, these states, making up what was known as the Holy Roman Empire, owed their dedicated allegiance to an emperor, one bearing the divine authority of the church and rightful claim to the throne of the original Roman Empire. The states had their local rulers and a great deal of autonomy, but the emperor reigned supreme, resolved internal disputes, and kept the empire united. Charlemagne had been the empire's original founder, having established the realm in the year 800, but it wouldn't be until the rule of Otto the Great nearly two centuries later that its German character truly took hold, so much so that the empire's official title would be changed to the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation later down the line. There existed a delicate balance of power between the emperor, the church, and the princes of the individual states. Disagreements between the emperor and the pope in the 1070s would see both test the limits of their power, with the pope ultimately excommunicating or expelling the emperor from the church, cancelling out his divine authority, and releasing the princes from their oath of loyalty to him. The emperor would eventually be absolved after a demonstration of humility, and order for the time would be restored. But the long-term damage had been done. The church and states knew of the influence they held over the throne and almost immediately would begin chipping away at imperial unity. Over the course of centuries, this would see the empire become the disunited amalgamation of states that most recognize. But while the Germans fragmented and squabbled amongst themselves, their once divided neighbors in Western Europe would begin to solidify into larger kingdoms, giving rise to the countries of France, Spain, and England. It soon became clear that while Western Europe was advancing, the Germans were falling behind. As if political division wasn't enough, a great religious schism would drive another wedge between the Germans as Northern Protestantism arose to challenge the old Catholic order of the South. Despite all this, the title of Holy Roman Emperor persisted, though greatly diminished in its capability. The title would become the consecutive possession throughout many of these years by one noble family in particular, the Austrian House of Habsburg. The Habsburgs stood virtually unmatched in all of Germany, that is, until the year 1740, the Austrians were suffering a succession crisis and were in a particularly vulnerable state when 28-year-old Frederick II of Prussia inherited not merely his kingdom's throne, but a robust economy and imposing military as well, both products of his father's dedicated work to the country and tools which young Frederick intended to put to immediate use. Prussia would seize Silesia, one of Austria's most valuable and developed lands, decisively defeating them in three Silesian wars and raising Prussia's status from a secondary German state to that of a continental great power, much to the expense of Austria's prestige. Following the Napoleonic Wars and reorganization of the Holy Roman Empire by Napoleon, three major German entities remained. In the south stood Catholic Austria, the largest, wealthiest power within Germany and historic leader of the states. In the north was Protestant Prussia, a kingdom more military than state, who was demonstrating exceptional developmental and economic growth, appearing quite ready to surpass Austria in a matter of decades. Between them stood the states of the German Confederation, a successor to the Holy Roman Empire which simplified the previously hundreds of states into a mere 39. Prussia and Austria were themselves members of the Confederation, with the next largest members being Bavaria, Hanover, Wurttemberg, and Saxony. Aside from reorganization, Napoleon had brought onto Germany concepts of nationalism, republicanism, and the ideal of a united German nation-state, in contrast to the historic multi-ethnic empires of old. Austria still retained these old traits, with more than half of its empire being occupied by Hungarians, Romanians, Italians, and Slavs of all kinds. Its ethnic German population made up only roughly a quarter of all Austrian citizens, this multi-ethnic imperial model provided an easy means of building military might, labor output, and resource wealth through the conquest of foreign lands, but came with the great handicap of creating an ultimately disunited state, whose survival depended upon maintaining prosperity, the absence of which frequently incited independence movements and violent revolts, which in turn further weakened the state, thus making it less capable of providing prosperous conditions, leading it down a cycle of decline. Prussia, on the other hand, through slow, steady, and tactical expansion, maintained a majority ethnic German population and enforced strict national unity, preventing the decline experienced by Austria. This meant that Prussia was limited in how it could expand and would have to do so more gradually through minor annexations in place of massive conquests. One way in which Prussia achieved this was through its creation of a united customs union in 1818, which did away with the costly tariffs and lengthy inspections, which came as a consequence of transporting goods through Germany's many states. 
Year by year, more states would join the Union while Prussia took it upon itself to exclude Austria as much as possible. Prussia had successfully dug its roots into the majority of Germany, all the while enriching itself through optimized German trade. Prussia would in turn invest this newly acquired wealth in expanding its army so as to challenge Austria once more in a struggle for ultimate dominance in Germany, a struggle known as the Austro-Prussian War. In a display of who initially held the upper hand within Germany at the time, Austria successfully managed to rally behind it the majority of the German states, including the four largest states of Bavaria, Hanover, Saxony, and Württemberg. Even despite Prussia's contributions to German unity, none of these states looked favorably upon annexation by Prussia, seeing them as a threat to regional identity and the Catholic faith. Despite a seeming numerical advantage, the Austrian army was outnumbered by the Prussians, who conscripted a much higher percentage of their population. Even with the men provided to Austria by its German allies, Prussia was able to draw twice as many allies from Italy in the far south, motivated by the promise of Italian lands then held by Austria. Austrian forces were split between two fronts while the German allies, because of lack of cohesive organization, were easily divided and picked off individually. The Austrians were suffering several more casualties than the Prussians and were ultimately forced to submit. The Austrians were reduced of territory, excluded from German affairs, and politically damaged, so much so that a compromise needed to be forged with the Hungarians to stave off a secession, bringing an end to the Austrian Empire and replacing it with the Austro-Hungarian dual monarchy. Cut off from Germany and with Italy having solidified its own sphere of influence in the south, Austria was left with only eastern prospects to turn to, leading to its involvement in the Balkans and clashing with the eastern powers. The northern German states would be annexed by Prussia into the North German Confederation, while the South German states, though still independent, were coerced into a pact of mutual defense, which would ultimately lead them to willingly unite with Prussia against France and forge the German Empire. Prussia was determined to make Germany an unrivaled global power through military strength and economic dominance. Within less than a decade, Germany would have established overseas colonies, participated in several foreign interventions, and repeatedly stepped on the toes of France and Britain. Relations between Germany and Austria would eventually be repaired, but together they stood virtually surrounded by enemies with no mutual alliances in sight. This hostile environment, paired with Germany's relentless jabbing at its rivals, would ultimately see the escalation of an Austro-Balkan conflict into the First Great War, which in turn set the stage for World War II, bringing upon Europe and the globe a destruction unmatched by any other conflict in all of history. But what if that changed? What if in an alternate timeline, it was not Prussia who united Germany, but Austria? But first, a word from our sponsor. Do you remember when things were simple? Back before you had to carry a cell phone and all those cards in your pocket. Ridge Wallet remembers. Ridge knows how hard it can be to carry an overstuffed wallet these days, and while those fancy schmancy businessmen over at Big Tech would prefer you get rid of your wallet entirely, Ridge took the tried and tested tool that is the wallet and brought it into the 21st century. Ridge lets you carry up to 15 cards and plenty of cash while taking up only a fraction of the room a leather wallet does. Ridge wallets block RFID chips in your cards from being read by hackers. They're made out of sturdy materials and every single one is backed by a lifetime guarantee. Go to ridge.com slash monsterz and use promo code monsterz at checkout to get 10% off and free worldwide shipping and returns. Ridge wallet. It's a wallet made simple. Now, back to the video. You might ask, what difference does it make if Austria united Germany in place of Prussia? Well, it's important to remember that Prussia was a quickly advancing militant and relatively new power on the European scene. Those factors combined reaffirmed Prussia's sense of superiority and disaffection to the old great powers of France, Britain, and Russia, whose time in the sun was coming to an end while the German age was just beginning. Austria, on the other hand, was itself a seasoned great power with centuries of German leadership, foreign ties, and geopolitical strategies behind it. The Austrians aren't likely to upset the European balance of power as their immediate ambitions outside of uniting Germany range as far as retaking Italian lands and Germanizing the Hungarian territories, goals whose realistic consequences for the time would be minimal regardless of if they were successful. This contrasts strongly with Prussia's global ambitions and desires to surpass Britain. Unlike Prussia, the Austrians are not so overconfident in their abilities, and even with the whole of Germany behind them would not attempt to antagonize Britain without the reliable support of at least one other great power. The Austro-Prussian War had seen Prussia surpass Austria in tactics, discipline, weaponry, and in total manpower if Italian forces are taken into account. 
To defeat the Prussians, Austria would need to either draw in support from a foreign ally or improve upon what it already had. The Austrians had unfortunately soured ties with Russia after having abandoned them in the Crimean War and allowing France and Britain to ravage the Russian navy. The Austrians were meant to be allies to the Russians, but feared them growing too strong, ultimately costing Russia the victory and Austria a valuable ally. In the West, Austria had not held the closest of ties with France, and the two historically clashed regardless of France's regularly changing government. France was at best an opportunistic ally, who might have supported Austria if it sensed Prussia to be a greater threat. However, France expected Austria to defeat Prussia, and planned on offering its support to the Prussians once it was more desperate, as a means of forcing a territorial concession. However, their support proved unnecessary, and all France got out of the conflict was a new rival on its border. Austria's only real chance then would be better coordination with its German allies, helping the Bavarians to push north more quickly, thus encouraging Hanover to not surrender, and in turn forcing the Prussians to invest more heavily against a united western front, splitting their resources in two. Austria would also need to better defend Saxony and Bohemia. This could be achieved if we assume Austria had made earlier preparations for such a conflict, or if Austria abandoned the Italian front and directed all those resources against Prussia. That's anywhere from 100,000 to 200,000 men, plus the soldiers of Austria's German allies who would now be able to fight an offensive campaign instead of a defensive one. The Austrians had attempted to redirect their southern armies northward in our timeline, however by that point it was already too late and all this had done was allow the Italians to recapture lost ground, turning both fronts of the war against Austria's favor. If we assume Austria redirects the majority of its southern resources to the north, this would allow the Italians to push as far as the Dalmatian coast, in which time Austria and its allies would have successfully defeated Prussia. We'll assume for the sake of this timeline that Austria not only neglect the Italian front to focus on Prussia, but that earlier preparations are made both domestically and with the German allies, so as to better operate as a more disciplined and cohesive force. This latter point might be a great demand to make, but aside from simply having better luck this time around, it would be the only realistic way for the Austrian alliance to decisively overwhelm the Prussians. We might propose that the Austrians negotiate a separate defense pact with Bavaria, Saxony, Württemberg, and Hanover, in which Austria would assume total military command in the event war breaks out within the German Confederation between Austria and Prussia. An alliance of this kind could have emerged in the immediate aftermath of the 1848 revolutions, when Prussia attempted to establish a North German Union, only for Austrian allies to respond with the Four Kings Alliance, which counter-proposed their unity with all of Austria, including its non-German lands. The alliance sought to further integrate German standards, practices, and infrastructure as well, and could have easily proved an excellent opportunity for Austria to increase its interoperability with the other states in regard to military and communications. Whatever the case, by the time war rolls around, the Austrian alliance is more than ready and ultimately emerges victorious. Seeking to neutralize Prussia by diminishing its ability to make war, Austria would strip them of their westernmost territories, Brandenburg and the city of Berlin included, as well as permanently exclude them from German affairs. With Berlin captured, the Prussians would be forced to move their capital back to Konigsberg in the Far East. For Austria and Germany, this means the removal of a large, threatening Prussian presence right on the border, and a reorienting of Prussia's political sphere toward the east. Saxony would directly annex Brandenburg, while Hanover would claim Westphalia. Austria would have sacrificed its Italian lands and lost its access to the Adriatic Sea, but in doing so would have demonstrated to the other German states where its loyalty stood. With the Prussians expelled from Germany and Austria being the essential last man standing, the Greater Germany plan would draw closer to reality. There was hesitation to include Austria's non-German lands into such a union, but following the Hungarian Revolution of prior years, Austria had set about Germanizing this region and enforcing strict adherence to Austrian law. This effort was moving along with general success, but in our world, after being left economically and militarily crippled by Prussia, the Austrians could not afford to continue. This time, things are different. Franz Joseph of Austria would seize upon the pride felt between the German states and having effectively come together against a shared enemy, to put forth a final call for German unity under Austria. He, as Emperor of Austria, would assume the role of Germany's new constitutional monarch, to whom each of the German princes would owe their allegiance to. As executive, the Emperor would also have a directorate of representative advisors appointed by the princes of each major state, with two additional representatives serving for the lesser states in a rotating cycle. A shared code of laws would be established for Germany as a whole, while each state retained the right to put forward their own regional laws so long as they did not conflict with the German code. New political bodies would be established including a legislative branch made up of a house of appointed representatives, an assembly of elected deputies, and a council of German princes. 
A Supreme Court would also be established for the purpose of reviewing contested legislation, mediating government disputes, and resolving legal cases between the states. This new Germany would be a hybrid between an empire and a republic, similar to the empire in neighboring France. Hungary would remain a territory of the new German Empire being treated much like a colony, and see Germanization continue well into the 20th century. Returning to Prussia, we find that they, under Bismarck, had been in the process of courting Russia as a potential ally, though less so for Russia's support, and more to deny that support to rivals like France and Austria. In this alternate world, with Prussia forcibly removed from the German sphere, their options for local allies would be limited to Scandinavia and the Russian Empire encouraging the diminished kingdom to reinforce its friendship with Russia, the two building off their shared resentment and animosity for Austria. The Russo-Prussian alliance will certainly make a move on Hungary, perhaps around the same time Russia would begin liberating the Ottoman-controlled Balkans, seeing Hungary's Transylvanian territory annexed into Romania, while the Slavic lands of Galicia and Slovakia see direct annexation to the Russian Empire. Prussia fighting primarily against United Germany, though its tactics remain superior, would now be going up against a far larger enemy with a greater economy and population. It would be at this point that Prussia knew it could never again reconquer Germany, and the new German Empire was here to stay. The Austrians don't engage in war with France immediately following the Austro-Prussian War, as Austria wouldn't need a follow-up conflict to motivate unity among the German states, having already had their united support against Prussia. One exception I could see being made for an alternate Franco-Austrian war is if Austria attempted to seize back its conquered lands from Italy, thus prompting retaliation by Italy's ally of France, but the Austrians in all likelihood would be too exhausted from fighting Prussia to do such a thing, and once German unity is achieved, reconquest of Italian lands might become an undesirable goal. Because France is never humiliated by Germany, the Second French Empire survives, and Napoleon III is succeeded by his son, Napoleon IV, who would likely oversee an era of French military expansion and aggressive colonization, as he had held a deep interest in military conquest, most especially in the African continent, so much so that it actually cost him his life while campaigning with a British colonization party in our world. Beyond everything else, an Austrian-led Germany would have avoided creating the conditions which ultimately led to the Great Wars. Austria is no longer forced to become a Balkan power, creating tremendous ethnic resentment in the region among the South Slavs. The Germany of this timeline is one whose focus is more internal and local. It holds grand ambitions, but unlike the militant Prussia, is willing to play a long game against the other great powers for the sake of maintaining a balance in Europe. This is an empire which has essentially survived in one form or another for a thousand years and has no plans of disappearing anytime soon. Other states will rise and fall, but united Germany will endure, and one day Europe may well bend to the whim of the Germans, but it won't be an overnight conquest. And that is where I'll end this video for now. The US of Z thanks you for watching, support your legion by liking the video, or join our ranks by subscribing for more. Mr. Z.